Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Luke DeWolf, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Hi, Rob. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Um, We are continuing our journey into Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. And today we're going into Chapter 5, which is titled The Hostile Brothers, Subtitle Archetypes of Response to the Unknown. Um. I guess before we get rolling on this chapter, maybe we could just give like a quick overview of the themes explored here. Um, I mean, we're going to start with like nature of evil, talk about some mythological representations of evil. And then the, the hostile brothers, this is the Cain and Abel story basically. Um, And these are, archetypal responses to the unknown um what what else are we getting into here uh i guess everything leading up before everything before heroic adaptation what else are we going to be touching on today sure yeah so so yeah as you as you say here hostile brothers i mean that the entire book has been building up what is the heroic mode of being what are examples of the right way to lead your life Mm. but the big theme in dr peterson's work and as he puts it the thing he was actually searching for this whole time was understanding the concept of evil and so this whole chapter gets into his analysis through these archetypal stories of what evil actually is and and there's some there's some really interesting things here because evil is not necessarily the big scary man who just wants to uh you know have power and kill stuff there, mm-hmm. there's there's other types of evil that are that are more mundane are more likely to see in your own life and so i think we're going to get into some uh, interesting conversations there but the the to deepen it uh, a little bit is is yeah just the the way evil is constructed and some some definitions of that that i i think are are interesting and then it it sort of turns into the the idea that uh, it it's a evil is a voluntarily degrading the shared map of meaning that a that a mm. society has developed and so it, it gets into uh, some complexities and then and then 
a little bit later on in the chapter, it's it's a lot of examples of how this played out in the 20th century, which which mm. was again, a, a focus of Dr. Peterson's work. I don't know, I don't know how much uh, uh, we'll we will specifically get into those those examples because I think for the for the most part, uh, uh, others tell it better. But but uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's a big part of uh, of this chapter. So yeah, a, a lot of themes that are. A bit different from what we've we've covered before, but I think this chapter is useful in in uh, if you can see these patterns of evil in in yourself or people around you, maybe you can uh, do something about changing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great point that this is uh, an ever present potential, right? It's this is what I often take issue when people say, "Oh." It's a good person or a bad person it's like well i think every action sort of defines you and you know you could have done good for a long time but that doesn't mean it's impossible for you to do evil and vice versa so um yeah i think this will be and this is where i think peterson's work was very valuable for me is that it started to uncover the value of mythology and how these stories actually are a representation for the intrapsychic or psychological process of how we adapt to one another and to the unknown and how that process of adaptation comes to be reflected in our social structures. Um, so we'll talk about some of that as we go. I was like, we'll kind of talk about the mythological representation and then try to distill this into a more practical interpretation um and yeah i think it's very it's it's mythological for a reason right these stories are very ubiquitous right they, they make sense at a lot of different levels of analysis um there, there's a you know there's a reason these stories have stuck with us for so long and it's because they have this uh semi-universal applicability something like that you know they can be used to understand our, our own internal rational processes, our social processes, cultural, et cetera. Um, and so to get started, I will just read the opening two paragraphs to chapter five, uh, where he sets this up. And Peterson writes, quote, the contamination of anomaly with the threat of death attendant on the development of self-consciousness amplifies the valence of the unknown to a virtually unbearable point. This unbearable amplification has motivated the development of two transpersonal patterns of behavior and schemas of representation, constituting the individual as such, embodied in mythology as the hostile brothers. One of these hostile brothers, or eternal sons of God, is the mythological hero. He faces the unknown with the presumption of its benevolence, with the unprovable attitude that confrontation with the unknown will bring renewal and redemption. He enters voluntarily into creative union with the Great Mother, builds or regenerates society, and brings peace to a warring world. The other, quote-unquote, Son of God is the eternal adversary, this spirit of unbridled rationality, horrified by his limited apprehension of the conditions of existence, shrinks from contact with everything he does not understand. This shrinking weakens his personality, no longer nourished by the water of life, and makes him rigid and authoritarian as he clings desperately to the familiar, rational, and stable. Every deceitful retreat increases his fear, Every new protective law, quote unquote protective law, increases his frustration, boredom, and contempt for life. His weakness in combination with his neurotic suffering engenders resentment and hatred for existence itself. So for those familiar with the Bible, this is obviously the story of Cain and Abel, right? The, the children of Adam and Eve. Um, Abel is basically the um what did he call this the mythological hero in this story and then cain is the mythological adversary and so in the story of of cain and abel um 
I think Abel is a sheep herder and Cain is a tiller of the land, something like that. And the gist of the story, as I understand it, is Abel's sacrifices are deemed worthy by God. Cain's sacrifices are deemed unworthy by God. Cain becomes jealous of his brother Abel, and he kills his brother Abel in his own jealousy. And then, you know, God asks him, you know, where, you know, the, where is thy brother Abel? His blood cries out to me from the ground. I might be getting the story out of order here. And Abel says that infamous line, well, am I my brother's keeper? And so there's this, I mean, looking at this through an economic lens, it's almost like Abel is the successful entrepreneur or the individualist, right? He's confronting the unknown with courage, intelligence, humility, and he's adapted to it successfully. It doesn't really explain in the story why God finds his sacrifices to be worthy and, and Cain's unworthy, but we're just sort of assuming that whatever Abel is doing is for the benefit of himself and others, and whatever Cain has been doing is not, right? He's not, his, despite his work, uh, it is an unsuccessful attempt at adaptation. And so you have Abel as representing this entrepreneurial individualist response to the unknown, and you have Cain representing the the fiat statist response to the unknown, right? Someone that's jealously, jealously responding to the successes of others by, well, in this case, killing them, engaging in, this would be fratricide, I guess, right? The, the murder of his own brother. Um, and so he's responding to the unknown in the way Peterson's describing, like in cowardice and fear and, and resentment, jealousy, et cetera. And so I think there's a, there's a, the kernel of the the fundamental divide here, right, between the individualist and the coercivist. And you often hear people talk about fascism, communism, Marxism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, as I think Ayn Rand put it, it's like it all comes down to individualism versus collectivism. Collectivism is too nice of a term, though. So I'm going to go with coercivism because it really is. It's either the individual has the right to life, liberty, and property, and every individual enjoys the same rights, and we all organize ourselves voluntarily, or there's some element of coercion injected into the the social, the mode of social organization. And that's captured in this story, I think. Um, so that's one interpretation of it to get us started. Yeah, I love it. And I mean, the this hostile brothers, you, you've got it that this is the archetypal example of this story, even to the point of that. Yeah, when when someone says hostile brothers, it's, it's going to be Cain and Abel, at least if you're from the Western tradition, uh, yeah. the the, uh, the the Christian tradition by by upbringing or anything, and and you, you know the, a couple of a couple of points of of this one that I I like the the uh, coercivism term I I, mm -hmm. I really enjoy that one and contrast that with uh, consensualism uh, mm -hmm. I, I think is is um, good alternatives to the sort of maybe addition uh, um, alternative terms of collectivism voluntarism but. Yeah, it's, it's a great way of looking at it, and and I think I think one of the key points here is that the reason why the sacrifice of Abel was accepted and the sacrifice of Cain was not, it doesn't matter why, mm. and that's a real good recipe for life because the the thing is you can have the best intentions mm. and do something, and the results just do not actually end up being positive right yeah. and 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 this is a funny thing in in bitcoin generally right the whole idea of of proof of work yeah you know proof proof of work is 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 fantastic and 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 you get people in the bitcoin community doing lots of of good things and 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 gaining merit in the in in sort of the, the system just just by by having been in the system and, and done done some work and it's it's fantastic mm -hmm. i think the work ethic 
in the Bitcoin community is is fantastic. And and what I'm about to say isn't meant to, to uh, belittle that, but mm. it's it's really the results that matter, right? Mm -hmm. The the miner who finds a block is the one that actually does the hash that satisfies the conditions to be a valid next block mm -hmm. on the Bitcoin time chain, right? Yes. So all of the other work does not actually matter, right? It's all attempts at getting to the thing, but it's the one out of hundreds of millions of billions, trillions mm -hmm. hashes that try only one actually gets the result, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's true in, in, in life, like trying, trying, trying on something that is just a failed venture. Mm -hmm. It's a sunk cost fallacy there, right? Mm -hmm. that, that just because you put in some work for something means you should get a reward. No, that's, that's not how right. life works. And so, I mean, I, I, I think, I think in, in fairness to the, to the sort of the terms proof of work and, and the community ethos that comes from that, they, it's, it's great to, to have this, uh, this ethos of industriousness, but the, but the thing is it, it does have to be about the results in the end. And I think one of the lessons from, from the Cain mm. and Abel story is that, well, okay, if you, if your sacrifice isn't accepted, because by the way, I think what that means specifically, God not accepting your sacrifice is really just the embodiment of the community. Mm -hmm. What we discussed before, mm -hmm. the 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 embodiment of the patriarchy, but not in the bad way, the social order accepts whatever it is you've done. Right. Okay. So th that means that means you've done well. All right, but but not having that sacrifice accepted well you can choose to do one of two things you can you can choose to mm -hmm. take the lesson and maybe do something else adapt adapt yeah or you can uh, you can react in a way that well bitter life resentment isn't fair. jealousy resentment mm -hmm. yeah yep. So that's it. It, it. It's a fantastic story, and 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 what what is it? It's it's something like it's only a few verses. It's it's yeah. it's a fantastic story, absolutely packed with meaning. Yeah, I, I I love this story. It's great. Incredibly dense story, and yeah, you. This is uh something I picked up from the book. I think the origin of wealth is the title of the book. Hein Heinbacher maybe is the author. Could be wrong about that. He described this as the algorithm of evolution. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't, discard it. Like it's very impersonal. It's how biology works. It's how free market capitalism works, right? If the innovation is useful and the tool gets the job done better, faster, or cheaper, well, then people will adopt it naturally, right? Out of their own self-interest and that tool will proliferate, right? Or the idea even it doesn't even have to be a, a physical tool necessarily. It could just be an idea, you know, like the number zero, like we think Bitcoin basically is proliferating because it's a more useful idea. Um, and so we have to be careful here because obviously work is essential to create these useful ideas or tools that then succeed on their own merits. So it is a, uh, how do they say this? Um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the term here where you say it's a, a necessary but not sufficient condition. So the work is necessary for a tool or idea to exist and then proliferate based on its own merits, but it's not sufficient. The work alone is not sufficient. The actual utility of the tool, right? The attributes, the services that it renders to its user are what determines whether it succeeds or fails on the free market, so to speak. So although proof of work is essential, it is not uh, sufficient, right? You can't just do the work and have it have there be value there, right? You can pay someone to dig a hole and fill it back in all day, every day, but they're not creating anything that's of use to anyone else. So although there's a lot of labor going into that enterprise, there's zero value, basically. This is the Marxist labor theory of value, right? Marxists actually believed that you could just, whatever labor you infused with a thing or an activity is what gave it value, but that's not true, right? What gives things value is people's preferences for that thing, right? This thing satisfies my wants, better, faster, cheaper. That's why I prefer it 
That's why I want it. That's what gives it value and gives it social relevance and a market price for that matter. So yeah, the Bitcoin example is good too. Although again, I think there's some nuance here because even all, so all of the energy that goes into that competition to solve the next block, you're right. It only matters who solves the block. That's the only thing that matters for the history of the Bitcoin blockchain or time chain. But the energy that went into that competition, even all the failed attempts, creates this protective barrier that makes it, it's an impediment for would-be attackers on the network, right? Like, So there needs to be this, well, free market competition, basically, that sorts it sorts wheat from chaff, as Peterson might say, and says, okay, well, these were all the wrong answers. We've tried all of them. We've, they've been dispensed with. And here's the one right answer. Um, but if you only had that one right answer, then it would be much easier. If, there, if you didn't have all these wrong answers and all this energy being allocated into the network, then the network would be more fragile, right? And someone could come in and tag it. So there's this, I don't know, free market competition is very healthy, right? Even in even in the failed attempts, right? The, the way that I've put this in the past was even when an entrepreneur goes up in flames, it's enlightening for the rest of us, right? We see what idea didn't work in one, in a time or place. And that's information too, right? It's like, oh, well, don't do that <laughs> in that time, in that place, in that context, do something else. So it's, I guess, again, it all comes back to feeding this ongoing process of, of adaptation. And the problem with Cain or the, the mythological adversary is that they don't contribute to adaptation. They just get jealous of the people that are successful and then seek to undermine them. At, you know, In this case, killing his brother. Uh, I think it also later he talks about resentment, jealousy, hatred, all of these this sort of dark triad of psychological traits that the mythological adversary exhibits, but these exist in uh, their ever-present psychic realities for us, right? When we when we see someone else succeeding in whatever domain we're trying to succeed in, there is a temptation to be jealous or there is a temptation to maybe try and undermine them or maybe they're dating the girl we wanted to date or whatever the thing is, driving the car we want to drive. There is that animal urge perhaps to try and um, pull them down, right? Rather than celebrate their success and excellence. And I think this mythological narrative is describing that right it's, it's describing it in a personified way but it's talking about us and how we actually work in our own minds and in social context yeah and and the this story is also right at the beginning of yeah. the bible it's yes. it's one of these it's one of these base key these stories. are the first humans by the way adam and eve technically first aren't human. human this is the first humans yeah yeah, 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 and 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 the the end of the story as well is fascinating because it starts a cycle of of vengeance. It's not really explained how there are other people to to take vengeance. I guess somehow there's relatives of these two first humans, but the mm -hmm. descendants of Abel uh, kill the descendants of Cain, who mm -hmm. escalate, 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 and create weapons of war, yes. right? And so and so the the idea here too is that it, it's not only the action of being jealous and the immediate reaction to that right it's it's also that these echo these mm -hmm. these actions echo yes. the negative things done to destroy someone like it, what what's the term um i forget who said this but but you know creating something is much harder than destroying something yes the destroying is is much much easier yeah and and so any progress that abel had created to give to the rest of of his society ended up being well he didn't get to continue to live and continue doing what was was successful and so the society was worse off for it and then That's worse right. the society became vengeful and yeah. and turned on itself um so i mean i guess lucky that the first humans made it out of that particular cycle although have we really um i i think the cycles of um com competing with one each one another over scarce resources uh, and sometimes getting violent that um, continues to this day. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, this uh, and this I think gets directly into the work of Rene Girard on mimetic desire. If anyone hasn't read that book yet, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. It's talking about this, right? Humans are naturally imitative. We are prone to desire the things that one another desire. And in that process of desiring, we often come to cross purposes, right? Where we'll, we both desire the same thing or the same person or whatever it may be, and we come into conflict. And so this is telling, I guess this story is telling us about ourselves. It's like, well, people come into conflict naturally. Uh, it, it, it Conflict itself is a source of the unknown, right? And so again, the, the, the subtitle to this chapter was how we respond to the unknown, I believe, archetypes of response to the unknown. Um, that, you know, you can respond, well, in truth, it's like, well, this is an unavoidable aspect of being human. I could respond to this with resentment and jealousy and rage and hatred, but that's just going to undermine, although it may directly undermine whoever I've identified as my enemy or my target or whoever I'm jealous of, you're also undermining the social fabric itself. So you're undermining civilization. And it, when you really take it all the way out, right? When you start stealing or killing or all of these things, it's like, well, what do you think, what example are you setting for the next person and the next person and the next person? So if they carried out that that approach to your if they emulated your response to the unknown what would be the consequence of that and so it's these stories i guess the again it's like holding up a mirror to how we operate and the etymology so obviously he kills his brother out of jealousy this is very interesting the etymology of the word jealous is related to the word zeal which is commonly associated with like religious fanaticism um so, again, I would just say check out Gerard's work on that. I don't, I don't want to get too far off the rabbit hole, but it explains a lot of things. It explains the origins of religion. Um, it, it, he talks about anthropologically how we're very imitative of one another. And then he basically work, works in Christ as the revelation of this whole thing. It's like Christ kind of held up the mirror to us and said, here's how we actually are. So, you know, instead of having these endless blood feuds right where oh you killed my brother then we'll kill someone in your family then you'll kill someone in my family and like these blood feuds that go on and on and on and on you get christ right which says when the enemy slaps you turn and give him your other cheek right we have to put an end to these endless cycles of of vengeance if we are to adapt to reality successfully right um okay i think from there, we'll probably go into the nature of evil, and and I've got a few definitions, but I'll stop there and see if you have anything you wanted to share. Sure. Uh, well, the the last point on this, and maybe just to touch on the the Bitcoin analogy one last time, is that is that uh, in the game of Bitcoin mining, the natural reaction to not finding a block is to just keep trying, yes. and eventually you find a block. And there's yeah. also been this natural, this natural uh, pooling of resources. Literally, they're called mining pools that yeah. get together and and do this game cooperatively so that everyone can can benefit. Right? That's the that's the idea. It in practice, maybe there is actually some gray area here, but this isn't the the forum to discuss that. But the point is, the miners aren't going and attacking their fellow miners for being more successful than them or having a exactly. hash rate, right? So, yeah. I mean, when that starts happening, then then we've got some interesting problems in the Bitcoin community. But but the that particular game uh, is uh, all the actors are choosing to to continue to play the game the right way. And Kane made the choice to not play the game the right way, the game of life. Yeah. He he chose to he chose violence, yes. but. The alternative would have been to try to find something that that would work, and and that where Bitcoin mining isn't the right analogy is because you just keep doing it, and and eventually you'll you'll succeed. That isn't a, actually a metaphor for for life. In in life, you might have to change your strategy. Yes, uh, and, and that's what and that's what Cain uh, did not do. And so, the the idea here is that the 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 second paragraph that that you uh, you touched on also kind of brings in this uh idea of shrinking from the 
uh, the unknown, shrinking from the the things that are not completely within control. And so the um, the shrinking weakens the personality, something like that. And and this is interesting because considering this spirit of of weakening against the challenge of that really being the nature of evil again i know it's it's going to get into it more here shortly but like i i think that's really really quite interesting here because it's it's not some movie version of of this it's 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 really something that is easy to do it's it's often often hard to rise to to the challenge and yeah. shrinking away sometimes is the easy thing. So that's that's what comes from it. Uh, I I hope uh, that the next paragraph is the the next up on the on the list here because it it, it defines uh, sort of these two types of of adversary. Uh, um, the uh, were you, were you going to go on to the next paragraph there? The personality. Uh, of the yeah, I'll let I'll let you if you want to read them. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you do that. I would just to throw in one thing on what you just said there uncomfortable conversations for instance very easy to shrink away from those right like mm. no one wants to have that conversation with their boss or their subordinate or their significant other or their children whatever it is like there's a lot of uncomfortable conversations to be had in life well that is the domain of the unknown and there's a reason there's a natural reticence to that but there are studies that are that have been done that said actually people's willingness to have uncomfortable conversations is a direct indicator of their success in life in multiple domains right like family happiness financial etc so again it's that voluntary courageous orientation to the unknown that actually determines your success in life so it's it's this is not just i just i bring that up to say this is not just mythological fairy tales this is this is actual practical uh, codes of conduct, I guess you might say, that are actually useful in in the reality of being human. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like, just having courage is the yeah. is the idea, right? Like, yeah. uh, I hadn't I hadn't thought of it that way. That that uh, yeah, if, if someone has the courage to go have those difficult conversations, uh, I, I know it's that's how you get things done. You cut through the the yes. corporate whatever it is that's that's holding you back and. Uh, um, brings brings uh, egos together so that yeah. something can actually get done. And information and it, flows. It, so yeah. right, it, it contributes to the adaptivity of the organization to whatever the problem is. Whereas if you just don't want to, you don't want to be the bearer of bad news. As he later says in this chapter, the bearer of bad news is what presages reconciliation to reality. Like if you don't get the bad news, you can't adapt to it. Mm. So again, I, I guess the 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 big theme here is well, how do we keep information flowing truth flowing into the structure so that we are adapting to the always changing terrain of the unknown absolutely and well so i, I think this is a perfect segue into the this next paragraph as well because it, it mentions the the two personalities of the adversary so so just to get it because it, it, this this absolutely ties directly in here so the personality of this adversary comes in two forms, so to speak, although these two forms are inseparably linked. The fascist sacrifices his soul, which would enable him to confront change on his own to the group, which promises to protect him from everything unknown. The decadent, by contrast, refuses to join the social world and clings rigidly to his own ideas, merely because he's too undisciplined to serve as an apprentice. The fascist wants to crush everything different, and then everything. The decadent immolates himself and builds the fascist from his ashes. The bloody excesses of the 20th century manifest most evidently in the culture of the concentration camp stand as testimony to the desires of the adversary and as monument to his power. Mm. So the fascist and the decadent; those are the two for, the two terms that keep on um, cropping up throughout this chapter. And I just wanted to get in there and um, give his definitions of of what these are. And they're they're interesting. They're they're not exactly the same as as fascism, the political concept, right. uh, but but it's it's interesting. Sacrifices the sacrificing the individual soul to the group as protection against the unknown. And I mean, 
I think we can we could go into great detail on plenty of examples from the modern day and and of course from the 20th century but the decadent is is interesting it's 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 also sort of the disconnection from the the current social world and and I think yeah. we see that today too so uh it's it, I, I just like these terms and they they crop up later and and so I I I think uh, Dr. Peterson got got on to something uh here uh, sort of D- uh, separating these things into into two distinct but related personalities. Yeah, what came up for me there was, you know, decadence is typically associated with excessive spending, right? Luxurious living, just, you know, um fancy cars and clothes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what was coming up for me there was, oh, Weimar Germany, right? When they had the hyperinflation, there was a lot of decadence until the currency collapsed and then from the currency collapse the ashes of that currency collapse rose hitler right the actual fascist so there's not again again it's just like a real world example of of this it's not just um storytelling this is we see it play out in real life if you are a business owner or manager you should know these three numbers 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, 1, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash what is money. We want you to join us for two days of discussions and debate, which is all happening at the inaugural Dissident Dialogues 2024. This incredible event will take place in Brooklyn on May the 3rd and 4th. You'll be joining leading thinkers such as Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, Ian Hersey Ali, John McWalter, Aisha Akambi, Michael Schellenberger, Mary Harrington, Chris Williamson, Winston Marshall, Constantine Kissin, Francis Foster, and more. Hang on a second, since when have you ever been a serious thinker? I love thinking, it's my favorite hobby. Sometimes, of an evening, it's all I do, think. Moving swiftly on, we want you to join us for a gathering where everyone is part of the conversation. Conservatives, progressives, atheists, theists, left, right, and everything in between. Dissident Dialogues presents a rare opportunity to immerse yourself in a conversation with the most influential thinkers of our time. We'll tackle important topics relating to religion, science, politics and culture. If you're driven by intellectual honesty, curiosity and a desire for the truth, Dissident Dialogues is the place for you. It's not just an event, it's the beginning of an intellectual journey and we want you to come along for the ride. I like rides. Dissident Dialogues is a place for dangerous ideas. Buy your tickets now at dissidentdialogues.org and be part of the conversation. Should we go to the nature of evil now? I've got a few definitions. Sounds great. Okay. Um, So I'll read an excerpt from Peterson shortly on the nature of evil but just some useful definitions and i've shared these previously but just to set them up i mean this is how i've framed my thinking on the topic and these are all i think these are all derived from other people i mean the first one first definition of evil that i found to be useful is that evil is the force which believes its knowledge is complete this is that totalitarian mindset right the idea that whatever knowledge you have attained that you could be the society the individual whatever it may be is total right there is no new knowledge to be acquired so all the questions have been answered 
there is no further need for exploration or inquiry or questions because all the questions have been answered, right? We have the final solution, the ultimate totalitarian plan, basically, right? This again, the word totalitarian implying totalized knowledge. So that's one form of evil. And it's evil because again, well, you always need to learn new things and you always need to adapt. So if you ever think you've got the final solutions, well, as the Bible teaches us, pride comes before the fall, right? When you think you've got the final answer, that's when reality is going to take you out at the knees, basically. So that's one good definition. Another good definition of evil, and this is secondhand from Peterson. I don't know, one of his lectures maybe. Evil is the purposeful use of self-consciousness to do harm to another. So if I can use my own self-reflection, right? Like my own memory of experience or even projection into the future and determine what would be harmful to me, what I would not like done to me. And then I use that self-reflection as a tool to do that very thing to you, right? That's evil. It's like you're using this, this fundamental human capacity that for, for reflection and reason even, right? You're almost using rationality but you're bending it to immoral or unethical purposes. I mean, Ayn Rand would say it's actually, you're even using it irrationally because if you start to steal or hurt other people or do whatever these things are, then you start to unravel the social fabric, which is not rational behavior in the broader scope of human civilization, right? And this is crystallized in the, is this the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then there's the silver rule version of that. Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you, right? These, all of that is, that definition of evil is contained in those two uh, rules. And the third one, I think, I don't, I don't know where I got, maybe this is an original, I'm not sure, but to our theme, evil is that which inhibits adaptation, right? If we inhibit the adaptation of, someone or ourselves um that could be considered evil now that maybe that be that might be too much there may be an amoral element to that right like something could inhibit your adaptation that was not a product of human agency so maybe that wouldn't necessarily be evil like I, i'm not sure um you know in the, the tower of babel what they built, tried to build the tower to God and then all of their languages were confused and no one could communicate, right? So maybe there's certain things we can do that destroy our ability to communicate and adapt, um, but things that we willfully do to inhibit adaptation of ourselves or others, I think that is, that's basically evil, right? You're, you're undermining the, the process of life itself. So sort of three useful frames to think about evil. And with that, I'll read this excerpt from Peterson now on page 315, who writes, quote, evil like good is not something static. It does not merely mean breaking the rules, for example, and is not simply aggression, anger, force, pain, disappointment, anxiety, or horror. Life is, of course, endlessly complicated by the fact that that what is bad in one circumstance is positively necessary in the next. I noted previously that the answer to the question, what is the good, must in fact be sought in the meta-domain, so to speak. The more fundamental mystery, given the context-dependent nature of the quote-unquote good, is how our answers to the question, what is the good, endlessly and appropriately generated the good then becomes the set of circumstances that allow the process of moral construction to flourish or becomes the process of moral construction itself. The problem, what then is evil, must be addressed similarly. Evil is the rejection of and sworn opposition to the process of creative exploration. Evil is proud repudiation of the unknown and willful failure to understand, transcend, and transform the social world. Evil is, in addition and in consequence, hatred of the virtuous and courageous, precisely on account of their virtue and courage. 
Evil is the desire to disseminate darkness for the love of darkness where there could be light. So, yeah, I, I mean, this is not, I guess, what is he saying here? It's it's not a static thing, which we'll get into more later, but it's this ever-present temptation, right? As we are adapting to the unknown and we're existing in competitive domains in multiple levels, we're inevitably going to lose or fail or come up short or come in second or come in third or 10th or last or whatever it may be as we are constantly engaged in these games. And there's always going to be that temptation to want to say to hell with this, you know, screw that guy. I, you know, I'm going to say bad things behind his back or I'm going to do, you know, Whatever you can do to undermine the success of whoever outcompeted you in that go that game, that's always a temptation. But refusing that temptation and instead choosing to allocate your energies into either playing a different game or playing that game better or otherwise becoming excellent in some domain, right, where you find some fit between your skill set and what people need, right? You become relevant and valuable and meaningful to other people through your efforts. That is the the heroic path, right? Resisting this temptation to degenerate into anti-heroic behavior, let's say, and following the heroic path. That's what these stories are about. And I think that is the the axis between good and evil. Oh, yeah. Great way of putting it there at the end. And and the the definitions, the definitions are are fantastic that that you you put together. I I absolutely agree. And I think the the key point here is that evil is this force that is you know through individuals when an individual decides to channel their energy to something negative for another person instead of simply something positive for themselves because it all has to come down to this this individual level right that the individual makes the conscious choice either to do something good or like like create something build something put effort into something to create something positive or destructive jealous yeah. envious negative and I, I mean jeff booth puts it another way that that what do you put your attention to creates your reality right mm -hmm. so so that that the point that if if you have your attention directed towards something negative, something jealous, something you're envious of, a problem, whatever, instead it, you could direct it to something positive and just focus on building a good thing. And, and I, I think this is a lesson for not to get caught up in hmm. drama or, or, uh, or, uh, people that, that, that are, are dragging you down or, or, uh, just being being jealous of the the people that are successful and try to build something for yourself. This this is part of the the one of the twelve rules. Um, you know, set yourself uh, in order before mm -hmm. uh, set your house in perfect order before criticizing the world. This is a, a goes along with that vein. I think. Yes. Focus on you. Don't criticize the world unnecessarily. Criticize the world when you might actually have something knowledgeable to say about it, mm -hmm. and uh, accompanied by experience. But but just being jealous and criticizing the world because other people are more successful than you—that's that's not the way to achieve it. But yeah, the Jeff's um, Jeff's quote is something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, it, it, it's a good one. So. Oh, I like that a lot. It reminds me of um, one I've I picked this up in yoga class. I think where attention goes, energy flows. Right. So we really do build. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, right? Are these social, psychic, cultural realities that we construct with storytelling? Uh, there, obviously, there's a biological basis to this, biological, social basis. But then a lot of the construction of these stories then guides us in how we develop morality and, and ethics and whatnot. So it's a very, there's a very interesting feedback loop there. And yeah, where you, point your attention 
you know, again, energy goes there. So if you're focusing on the bad things, and I'm very guilty of this, by the way, I get very frustrated with little annoyances, whether it's like inefficiencies or, you know, technology not doing what I want it to. I get very frustrated and I'm prone to just getting upset about it. And I, I, I need to get better about it to train myself to focus my attention. Like those things are going to come up. You got to deal with them, but to try to focus my attention more on, on the positive things. Um, and that determines, there's another saying I picked up in yoga class, your vibe attracts your tribe. You know, when you actually do point your energy on things that are positive and constructive, it's sort of that spirit inhabits you in a way and you become more positive and constructive. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, reconcile, I guess we might say that these stories are sort of reconciling ourselves to ourselves, right? It, it really, I keep using the metaphor of a mirror, but I don't know what else to say. It's like, well, we've observed humans interacting for very long periods of time. We've started to record that in imagistic, artistic form, and then more recently, verbal stories, right? And then even more recently, written stories. And all of these things have been sort of distilled down, distilled down, and distilled down into some of these very dense mythological narratives. And so they are a record of how we actually are, how we actually operate. And you can use that record. It's almost like an owner's manual to being human, right? It's like, oh, let me open this thing and see how I actually work. And if you understand how you actually work, then you can start to tweak yourself, right? You don't need to be jealous, resentful, et cetera, right? You can identify these things in yourself and start to, to take a different psychological direction. And um, that's, I mean, what could be more useful than that, right? An, an owner's manual to being human. <laughs> Um, I completely agree with that point, and and I, I feel exactly the same way about this because you know you know one of the the criticisms of of Dr. Peterson in general and and you know, map, maps of meaning and all this is is like stories are someone has to think of them. There's ulterior motives. Uh, people are just trying to control each other with them, and and there's there's valid criticisms. There there of course are 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 stories that uh, are misused by mm -hmm. by people with power to control and i think the definitions we just would have um just have gone through uh, <laughs> they'd be doing evil things by doing that basically mm -hmm. but, but now the owner's manual thing that's the key point because that's why this book started with the mundane things, how people orient themselves in the world, how the neuropsychology, the neurobiology mm -hmm actually maps onto this stuff and then and then you can just take a look at some stories and if they are deep enough if they actually resonate because not every story actually has gone through this process right if yeah. if someone comes up with a story to put in their novel or a movie or or something like that and that story is not actually yeah. mythological archetypal that story is not going to have it's not going to to uh, mirror or resonate with the wisdom, the collective yeah. wisdom of archetypal mythology. But when a story gets it right, for example, the Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, or something like that, they're full of archetypal references. I don't bring those two up only on a whim either. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Peterson, Harry, Harry yes. Potter, a lot. Yeah. Um, they, they actually tap into these things. And, and there's a really good argument for it. That's why they end up popular. Yeah. Right, because people resonate with with yes. these stories that are actually reflecting the the archetypal stories, actually telling lessons. Right, whereas something that's contrived to make a political point or to uh, or to to uh, it, it just make commentary on whatever's going on in the day. Okay, well, maybe that's got some relevance now. But um, now, I, I just wanted to to say like this this owner's manual thing is is exactly the right way to put it. I like your your way of framing that and. And that's that's really why this this book was important to me as well is that is that yeah just have a guide and and be able to tweak your own behavior and and maybe to pull it back into the into the topic at hand right it's important to realize what is the difference between doing good in the world and doing evil in the world and the the yeah. definitions here are really subtle 
right? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's maybe it seems clear that evil is is the okay the opposition to the process of creative exploration. That's pretty clear to me, somewhat. But but it it's not. I know it's not. But but the the thing about this is it's it's subtle. You can go from doing good to doing evil easily in yes. in that way. It's, it takes a lot of self control, discipline, and I guess courage to to do good in the world. And maybe that's the scary part, right? Is that is that it's hard to be good uh it's easy to be evil and uh sometimes people don't like being challenged that way yeah the good the good versus evil that's the point of this chapter for sure yeah and he you know he gets deeper into this later where he talks about you know the intellect it's such a powerful tool but evil is also wrapped up in that where what's the old saying like answers that cannot be questioned right totalitarian knowledge like that's again the source of evil evil is a force which believes this knowledge is complete well there's the old saying i'd rather have questions that cannot be answered than answers that cannot be questioned like you have to have this there's an epistemic humility that is essential to the taming of evil i don't know you don't ever get rid of evil right there's always this temptation people are always going to fall prey to it we're always going to have to deal with its consequences but there does seem, again, if the more people that read this user's manual for being human, the more we can uh, create a revelation about evil, right? We can reveal the true nature of evil, the, the possibility of evil in ourselves, to ourselves, and therefore um, domesticate it. I'm not really sure. Like, again, you don't get rid of it. But you can learn to live with it in a way that maybe keeps it at bay or keeps its consequences less negative, something like that. So, and what could be more important than that, right? Understanding good and evil and understanding how to be good and not evil. Like this is the most probably essential question in in being human. And um, yeah, you know, you, you brought up the criticisms against Peterson and people talking about mythology and storytelling uh, you know, I guess they are valid if we if we buy into Nietzsche's will to power, right? That we're every use of any tool is basically a human trying to extend their own domain and sphere of influence, etc. Which I sort of I mean, I've read War Speak recently, which is a book about Nietzsche. It's actually really good. I actually subscribe to that. I think you know we we do we are part animal and we are trying to expand our our territory our domain our influence you know in a more human sense of the term we might say our legacy right our our uh position in the social hierarchy wealth etc um and so nietzsche would say like yeah so the use of all tools words included is in a, in an attempt to increase our power but i would but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't because I would also say that there is no tool more powerful than attempting to accurately portray the truth. Right? When you actually tell people, "Hey, this is how things really work and really are." You give people that useful idea or that useful tool, well then they take up that tool or idea willingly because it benefits them to know, right? To know how it actually is in reality. And so, you know, the, and the truth about humans, again, to the owner's manual point, is like we are prone to these things. We are prone to jealousy and resentment, et cetera, in the face of the success of others. But an interesting thing about jealousy, too, I think honesty is kind of like an antidote to jealousy in a way. Because if you think about it, think about a woman that sees the ideal marriage, right? She sees the husband she would want to have and he's married to the wife she wishes she could be. And they they have all the children that she wishes or she would like to have. If she goes up to that couple and confesses to them, says, hey, you know what? You have such a beautiful, you two make a beautiful couple. You have such a beautiful family. I'm just, you guys are lovely. In that act of confession or honesty, you've sort of transformed jealousy into just a compliment at that point, right? You've just shared the truth with them. Like, here's how I actually feel. And then in that act of confession, I don't, I think she's less likely to try to do anything to undermine. She's not going to try to like steal the girl's husband or, you know, undermine the family because she's just, 
shared with them, right? How she actually feels. And I'm sure they would take the compliment well, right? They'd be like, oh, thank you so much. And so I think maybe that's why there's this Christian emphasis on confessing our sins. You know, it's just like, just call a spade a spade, right? If you've done something wrong, confess it. If you feel a certain way, like rather than harboring that and being like, oh, I wish I could have that. It's like, no, that's a normal feeling. It was part of being human. Didn't you read the owner's manual? Just go confess it to them, right? <laughs> and it'll get it off your chest. And then you can sort of take your attention and energy back into the world and build something, construct something positive for yourself and others. So um, I do, you know, I subscribe to that will to power thing, but I don't think it's inherently bad or evil. I think, well, we need power to build good things too. So it's a matter of, um, I guess, trying to relate to one another truthfully and also being humble enough to accept the hard truths about ourselves. right? Like it might not, it's not an enjoy, it's kind of a bitter pill to swallow when you're like, oh, what do you mean we're prone to jealousy and resentment? Not me, like I'm whatever. It's like, well, Maybe you're less so than other people, possibly, or maybe you're more so. Who knows? But, you know, the truth is, as best we know it so far, contained in these stories. And if you have something new or unique or novel to offer, well, then go and, you know, become a philosopher or a religious leader or whatever. <laughs> Add to the corpus of these stories. So, anyways, thanks for coming great. to my TED Talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, well... <laughs> Oh, and and great points, and I've I've got a couple of things uh, there. Uh, the the other corollary to sort of confessing, as you say, the uh, the the things that are on your mind, the the jealousies and all this. It's also that having to be open when when you get called out as well. Yeah. Right. Because yes. I think I think that's even harder. Right. For is, sure. is, uh, if someone else confronts you with with your shortcomings, mm -hmm. being humble enough to admit that and to try to mend the situation and build a better world together that yes. takes a lot of humility and a lot of courage and and uh, not everyone uh can do it um and and then the the other thing on the the um the the sort of the will to power stuff that's that's fascinating and and well you, you know there certainly is a is a point there as you say the the difference i think with the archetypal stories and archetypal narrative is is first of all my assertion this is my assertion based on this entire book is is that when stories actually follow the archetypal pattern they are transmitting true information because yes. this is the sum of of human knowledge yes. right and it doesn't have to be a story that was that has been passed down for 5,000 years. It just has to resonate with the, the archetypal system. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing about it is if there is an individual that tries to use story or narrative in an attempt to, to have control or have power, like for example, uh, theocratic societies that are based on a, a religious book of some kind, mm -hmm. uh, and, exert power over that, uh, exert power over society through religious rules, something like that. Yep. This is happening across civilizations, across the world, it still happens, right? Well, okay, those are individuals taking this thing and yep. using it to their advantage. But it's not the it's not the story's fault or the or the mythology's fault that that occurs. It's also that these tend to be books that are written down in a specific moment of time where there are other things that are not necessarily archetypal also included. Like, mm. for example, a good chunk of the book of Leviticus is less relevant to modern society, and I would not call it uh, examples of archetypal narrative. But mm. the Cain and Abel story, just these short few verses, absolutely timeless, right? Mm -hmm. And so even though at some point or another that got written down there's there's good evidence that 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 plus the original early genesis story is some of the deepest mythology that that is is recorded from that that mm -hmm. part of, mm -hmm. uh, of the world right so it's it just turns into a, a a difference between the knowledge that is the sum of the the distilled wisdom across generations or alignment with that i think that's important mm -hmm. contrasting that with uh taking things out of context and individuals using things to their own advantage. Mm. Those, those are the, the, um, 
nuances there that are different. And again, it gets into the same thing, this 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 good and evil concept, right? Leaning into the positive messages and the and the positive understanding, the lessons that can be be taken from this stuff, or mm -hmm. use it use story narrative as a means of a system of control. Yes. That's evil, right? So right. again, back to the lesson. That's great. That's a great point. Um the the point about theocracy is well taken, and I, I really think this still this takes place every in all political systems today, right? If you saw a couple of years ago during the pandemic, right, Joe Biden was like had all this black and red lighting behind him, and he's pumping his fist and all. You know, he's trying to project this. I don't know what else you would call it, but kind of like this mythological air, right? He's some type of there's a lot of theatricality that goes into this political uh, game, let's say. So I would say it's true. It's especially true in theocracy, right? Where someone says, oh, I am the divinely appointed leader. So whatever this, you know, the holy book, I am a divine messenger of the holy book. But even in more secular political systems, there's still the the theatricality that is used to sort of project this image of yeah, uh, leadership, control, domination. I'm not sure the, the right word here, but, and I, you know, maybe that's a vestige of our tribal existence, or maybe it's an ineradicable part of just being a hierarchical humans, right? Like we sort ourselves into hierarchies. So we're always going to have this tendency to elevate certain people. And we, you know, again, this is why it's so complicated. We sort of need to elevate those people that are succeeding in whatever domain, right? Like there's Peterson always cites the example of the whole football team carrying the quarterback after they win the football game. Why are all those guys carrying that guy? It's like, because that guy led them to victory, right? So he was setting the example and leading the men down the field to score the points to win the game. So all the men celebrate him, right? They put him literally, physically at the top of the hierarchy. They carry him off the field. That's okay. That's fine and normal and necessary, but there's a danger there because if you start to confuse, right? Like the he, Peterson talks about confusing the principle of sovereignty with the particular sovereign, right? Where you start to think, oh, well, this quarterback who won the football game last night can do no wrong. He's a guru. He's got all the answers. Well, you're going to feed his ego, right? He might even become totalitarian at some point. And so there's, a, it's like, it's a, um, a necessary aspect of being a hierarchical species, but there's a danger that we might take it too far, you know, and start to think that this person is, has all the answers, so to speak. And that's when you get something like a theocracy, right? Like, oh, this guy's the, you know, not human. Basically, he's so, he's divinely appointed, and so. That, anyway, anyways, I say all that to try and say like that's kind of the truth of how we are, right? It's like, well, we sort ourselves into hierarchies, but there is this danger of the pendulum swinging too far, and um, and we have to be careful of that. And I guess to take it all the way back, it's like, well, how do you guard yourself against that? It's with a, a deep philosophy of good and evil. Right. Like you'll know if you, if that quarterback starts telling you to put people in a gas chamber or something, well, then if you have a deep philosophy of good and evil, you would resist that. Right. But if you don't have that deep philosophy of good and evil, and he's the guy that can do no wrong and has all the right answers, well, then you might just follow him. Right. You might just obey orders. So, again, that's why I think. That, I think the owner's manual metaphor is, is best for this. You're just talking about like really inspecting what it's like to be human and using that to properly orient yourself to other humans, yourself and others. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, 
And even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. Over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, but it wasn't until I started working with a biohacker, Anthony D. Clementi, last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. I think think, um, moving forward, it just deepens gets a little bit deeper into this uh, discussion of evil. So, Yeah, I think the next place I'd like to go is the mythological archetype of evil. So another thing Peterson's saying about these stories is like, well, obviously what we're talking about is, well, and this is, again, these stories come from a time before evolutionary biology, before psychology, before these sciences even existed, right? Yet they somehow explain all these different aspects of evolutionary biology and psychology, et cetera, et cetera, sociology. Well, we didn't have any of that during this time when these stories emerged. So these stories use the device of personification to represent more complex ideas, right? And so for evil specifically, the personification of evil is the mythological figure of Satan, right? The, the, the mythological archetype of evil is Satan. And so Peterson, I'll read this excerpt. This is on, on my page 316. Peterson writes, the figure of Satan is arguably the most well-developed representation of evil extant in religious and mythological thought. Although it is tempting to identify this personage with particular personality attributes, such as aggression, or with the differences of the stranger, it is more realistic to view him as the embodiment of a personal and social process. The devil is the spirit who underlies the development of totalitarianism, the spirit who is characterized by rigid ideological belief, by the predominance of the rational mind, by reliance on the lie as a mode of adaptation, by refusal to admit to the existence of error or to appreciate the necessity of deviance and by the inevitable development of hatred for the self and world. Each of these characteristics is intrinsically and causally related to the others. They are linked inextricably together and can be aptly conceptualized as a transpersonal and eternal personality. Um, He goes on to say some other things, but I think that pretty well captures it. Um, I'll I'll throw it over to you if if you want to make any comments there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as you say, the the idea is the the interesting idea that maybe we touched on a little bit before. This isn't identification with 
a specific attribute like aggression and i think that's kind of the the uh more specific way of saying this this isn't the movie version of of evil mm -hmm. right the um evil villain something like that but it's it's this this process and and the the active uh attempt to to take away that which has been created lying as a mode of ad adaptation uh refusal to admit the existence of error it it all goes back to to what you say here and and this actually reminded me of the um something you said earlier in terms of the uh the um the idea that you can't ever get rid of evil mm -hmm. uh the the previous stories have have been explicit in that you can't get rid of chaos mm -hmm. right oh, that's as right. in as yeah, in no. the the yeah yeah the the so so you can't get rid of the the dragon of chaos which mm -hmm. is what brings the entropy and and sort of the the system is never static right yeah. but evil is a specific thing that's slightly different from that chaos is not in itself evil which right. by the way for anyone who might get mad at the the uh, association of the feminine with chaos that right. is here that's explicitly saying it's that's not the same thing as evil chaos is not evil right, right. and so the the thing is here that evil i think is actually something intentional and i think it is also true that you you can't really get rid of evil as long as there is right. human nature and as long as there is this capacity for free will right yes. uh, because because evil as a mode of being is going to be tempting or or, or at least easier than being good right right uh, something 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 incentives uh, uh there's something incentives. There about that. yeah, <laughs> yeah but sure. yeah. Uh, but but that that's the that's the point i see here is that is evil is is a part of of human mode of being and i think uniquely human uh, yeah yeah agreed and yeah I, yeah again the strong agreement among bitcoiners who are inherently disagreeable seems to be that incentives matter a lot right but I would say it's an open question, to be completely honest. It's like, well, we don't really know. I mean, I don't think we really know how much material incentives influence this line between good and evil, right? I think it's Solzhenitsyn. The line between good and evil cuts down the heart of every man. My view, and I think this view, although I don't want to speak on their behalf, I think this view in general is shared by Bitcoiners that material incentives oscillate that line between good and evil, but not exclusively. It's not the only thing that influences it, right? You can be two rich guys, right? Well, you know, one guy worth a hundred billion, another guy worth 90 billion. Well, the $90 billion guy might be super jealous of the hundred billion dollar guy. It's not even material incentives at that point, right? I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's not like it makes a much of a difference in their quality of life or anything, but it might just be this mimetic competitive desire thing you know so anyways i say all that because it's just an open question but your point is well taken chaos or the unknowable unknown right the the unknowable horizon of the future if we want to put it that way is amoral right not moral not immoral it's amoral because it's not a product of human agency right nature unfolds phenomena happen the future comes like independent of whatever we do not maybe not entirely independent but you know this, as the old saying goes shit happens um whereas evil is distinctly immoral because it is the product of human agency right you can't uh, if and it's very, again it's very it's complicated right because if a bear if the grizzly bear kills you well we wouldn't really call the grizzly bear evil we just say grizzly bears is doing what grizzly bear does. But if a human kills you, well, then we might say, we might ascribe evil to that person, right? Saying that's not, that's an immoral act because, well, again, to kill or steal or do any of these things sort of unravels the social fabric, right? There's a, there's an, there's an implicit social contract or basic moral intuitions that we have cultivated over time and when you act against those that would be described as immoral versus the the amoral 
aspect of of just chaos as you describe so it's interesting there's yeah it doesn't seem like we can get rid of either one but we don't need to purposefully introduce chaos into w otherwise working systems right that seems to be something along the lines of evil um I'm, I'm reflecting now on the movie the dark knight right where the joker is literally that he, i think he calls himself an agent of chaos right he's just trying to insert chaos into the system basically um so that's not to say chaos is evil per se the, again the unknowable unknown but to try to purposely inject that into systems that serve or satisfy the wants of other people i think that's um you get into the domain of evil pretty quickly once you introduce human agency into that equation yeah full agreement on that and i i think there's there's a further distinction between purposeful injection of chaos and destruction maybe maybe there's an argument to be made that there those things are equivalent it's just a, a, a difference in terminology but no yeah. The intent intentional destruction of something is is I think everyone would agree that that's an inherent evil and maybe their destruction is required to inject chaos something like that but it, yeah that that that's the key point though I I agree with that fully because it's it's uh, it's really just the result of a person a human taking action to disrupt a good thing just to simplify yep. it right disrupting right. a good thing disrupting the success of someone who is doing better than you yeah that is that is evil yeah yeah agreed um if i go back to our one of the definitions of evil we provided earlier which was evil is that which inhibits adaptation again we might qualify that to say like evil is that product of human agency which inhibits adaptation like if humans start to interfere with the adaptation of other humans that seems to be evil right you're, you're actually you're doing the opposite of what the entrepreneur does right the entrepreneur furthers our adaptation right he gives us a new tool a new solution a new way to deal with problems better faster cheaper well the opposite of that would be sort of taking that away right inhibiting the process of entrepreneurship taking away solutions, creating more problems, basically, which interferes with our process of, of adaptation to the future. That, I think, is a pretty good definition of evil. But there's, again, it's complicated because that, although evil attempts to inhibit adaptation, or at least involves the attempted inhibition of adaptation, that may lead us to believe that it is like a static structure but as Peterson elaborates here, that evil is in reality also a dynamic process. And it is also adaptive. So like even though it's trying to inhibit our positive adaptation, evil itself is adaptive. Like it changes and, and whatnot. So I'm going to read an excerpt from 318. Peterson writes, To complicate things further, evil, like good, is not something static although it may align itself with all that is stubbornly static. It is rather a dynamic process, a spirit that partakes of the motivational or effective states of pride, resentment, jealousy, and hatred, but cannot be identified unerringly with the presence of any or all. The morality of an aggressive act, for example, depends on the nature of the context in which it is manifested. Just as the meaning of a given word is defined by the sentence, the paragraph, even the book or culture in which it appears. Evil is a living complex. Its nature can be most clearly comprehended through examination of the quote unquote personality it has quote unquote adopted in mythology, literature, and fantasy, elaborated in the lengthy course of historical development. This personality consists of those meta-attributes of evil that have remained stable over time despite dramatic shifts in the particulars of human existence and human morality. So, I, you know, there's so much subtlety here, right? <laughs> We're trying to define this thing 
But again, a definition itself is a stable static structure. And we've defined evil as that which inhibits adaptation. Adaptation is a dynamic process. So you might erroneously think, oh, if it's inhibiting a dynamic process, then maybe it's a static structure. But that's not the case, right? Evil itself is adaptive. So it's very complicated to wrestle with these things. Like as we try to get a hold of evil, well, it adapts, right? And it, it inhabits different personalities, as Peterson says, in these stories over time. And uh, I guess the point of that is to show or demonstrate different aspects of evil, right? That we've learned about over time. Again, again, we're consolidating all of these stories and sort of distilling them down to their essence. Well, that process... In that process, we learn new things about the nature of good and evil as we go. So we get new stories uh, about evil. And he, he actually talks about that, the the, the writings of um, uh, who author of Paradise Lost, uh, Friedman. Milton. I think. Yeah, Milton. Milton. Yeah. Yes, Milton, and uh, I forget who else. But he was saying that they've more or less contributed to the biblical corpus in writing about um the nature of evil and Satan as a, as a mythological representation of evil. Yeah. And well, and that, that gets also back to that Satan isn't actually really something from the Bible. It's from the, the post thing, right? Exactly. As you see the, yes. the, the Milton and the Dante and, the, and, yeah. and, and these guys, right. Which is, which is fascinating too, that this, this mythology has built out after theoretically. The well, this corporate. is causing a question. What is the Bible though? Because the Bible is this collection of books over time. So it's possible in X years time, Paradise Lost will be a book in the Bible, right? Like the Bible means library. It is a collection of books. It's been a living document for centuries. Is it still alive? Are we still updating it? I don't know. Well, and, and I mean, uh, there's arguments as well that there have been attempts to to update it. Uh, the uh, the Latter Day Saints, uh, the Mormons, have yep. done just that, right. and they've added their own things to the Bible. It right. just uh, they just forked off from Forks. uh, yeah. <laughs> from from mainstream Christianity. So I, I don't yeah. know. I, I don't know if we're going to get another hard fork on the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> ossification joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but I think I think the the interesting thing about this this passage to me is that uh, the what this shows is that evil is identifiable. It's sort of um, I forget who said this quote. It was some politician, but it was that uh, it was that I don't know what pornography is. I couldn't define it for you, but I know it when I see it. Something. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the same thing for for this for for evil. Like you you don't you don't necessarily exactly have the definitions for it. It doesn't map to any particular one thing, but you know it when you see it. Something like right. that. But the the uh, even though that's sort of a joke, it's it's it is also that these meta attributes of evil, I think, are what's important. That they're identifiable, right? That mm -hmm. talking about this and understanding that there exists something called evil in the world and that keeping that at bay is an inherent good mm -hmm. i mean that's the that's the leap i make that reducing the capability of those who are evil those who have evil intentions it's unfair to call someone evil inherently yeah, agreed just, just yeah um those who those who have evil intentions or do evil things uh keeping that at bay is mm -hmm. an inherent good i think that's that's the natural extension here and and that's one of the the um sort of antidotes to to this to the antidote to the adversary is is something like that and we'll, we will get into that but um yeah that's that's just my my point here is that is that being able to identify it is the first step yes it's an excellent point. I, I want to just maybe try to elaborate on how subtle this is because, again, the other definition of evil, and that I think this one is from Friedman in his book Paradise Lost, evil is the force which believes its knowledge is complete. Well, we are, we're doing that right now, right? We're always on the edge of evil. Anytime we assert an idea as if it, oh, this is how that works, right? This is how... 
we, we're describing something that occurs in reality as if our description is complete. Well, then we're sort of flirting with evil right there, you know, and this is, it, we'll talk about this more, how it's the intellect has this tendency to fall in love with its own creations, as Peterson says, and that is uh, a source of evil. Uh, another way I've heard this put is, you know, the mind is an excellent servant, but a terrible master. So um, it's very subtle, right? It's not just like, oh, there are, I am good. And there are people out there that might have evil intentions. It's like, no, you in your psychological psychic processes, anytime you think you've figured something out, you're kind of flirting with the edge of evil in a way right? Like if you think you have total knowledge about a thing and it doesn't mean that that is evil, like knowledge is evil, none of that. But, um, what does he say earlier? Like the refusal f to ask any more questions, to explore any further, right? To think you've got it all figured out. Like that's when you start to have these ideas that are so good. You know, this is like the totalitarian standpoint, ideas that are so good, they have to be imposed right ideas that are so scientifically proven that they need to be forcibly injected into people to use a very strong recent metaphor um it's you know it's subtle it's subtle it's not just people out there and you're good right it's in it's part of the the intra psychic process itself so anyways i was just trying to trying to highlight how subtle it really is it's not it's not so obvious. I guess that's the point of these stories, right? It's like to caution you against evil. Yeah, and you know, that's important, right? Because I think the the thing here, one one part of this that I like what what you said is is just if you know that you are capable of evil, and I think this is this is something that Dr. Peterson has tried to highlight a lot. If you know that you're capable of evil, that should scare you. Yes. First of all, that sh that should be that should be a terrifying thought that everyone confronts in order to get past that, yes. that that understanding of the capability of evil and then you can look out for it right yeah. again to bring it back to the practical because to to me this this is such a practical book even if it seems like it's just this theoretical stuff that comes out of stories taking the practicality in uh, extracting the practical out of this book is the value of this book to me. Yes. And the practical out of that is that you can understand when you are treading towards something evil. Yes. And learning what that looks like in yourself and understanding it and counteracting it, I, I think is one of the highest goods there is. Yes. And it's one the, and it's one of the ways that that an individual can transcend their own nature yes. and really become a successful person. Yes. In in many definitions of that word. So no, that's excellently said. And yeah, the, the ability to identify where you have gone wrong or could go wrong, which enables you to course correct synonymous again with adaptation right it's just again i'm thinking of the the now the the desert race truck drivers i don't know if you've ever seen these guys they they, they do like rally yeah yeah rally drivers so multi hundred mile loops right they're driving these very long but they have a guy in their ear that's and sometimes in the seat beside them and is, he's literally feeding them information about the course, right? So the driver's driving, he's using all the inputs, the data inputs he can, right? His sight, his feeling, et cetera. But he's also getting higher level information about the course and he's synthesizing this, right? Kind of meta awareness, like as you said, transcending oneself to know how like all humans work and know how you work in that particular time and place in that particular truck and you synthesize that information to drive the best race possible basically and um that's what this is that's what this is right this is the guy in your ear basically <laughs> the angel on your shoulder maybe
to use yeah a, the, a the angel on your shoulder and yeah. and you can listen to the angel or you can listen to the devil right the yeah. the devil is the spirit that that encourages selfishness and through selfishness which manifests in something that takes away from others yes. the angel is is uh probably advocating selfishness in something positive Right. Yes. Again, language is so delicate here because self-interestedness, I think, is perfectly fine. But I would draw that line between self-interestedness and selfishness. Selfishness is personal gain at the expense of others. All right. Self-interestedness is just seeking personal gain, not at the expense of others. Ideally, at the benefit of others. Right. That's what the entrepreneur is doing. He's seeking personal gain to become rich by satisfying customer wants. So that's um, the ideal. Thanks to my friends at Swan Bitcoin for supporting the show. Swan sponsored the Sailor Series, and I appreciate their support from the very beginning of the What Is Money show, and I'm happy to welcome them back. Swan has grown a lot since then. They've built a full-service Bitcoin-centric financial services company with several different offerings. With the Swan app, you can set up instant and recurring Bitcoin buys. And with this, you can get started at swan.com slash breedlove. Swan also enables clients in the U.S. to hold Bitcoin directly in an IRA account, so you can hold Bitcoin in a tax-advantaged way. Get started at swan.com slash IRA. If you're looking to buy more than $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, check out Swan Private. You'll get concierge support for buy execution, retirement accounts, inheritance and estate planning, and access to exclusive events, research, and other content. Get started at swan.com slash private. Swan Institutional provides financial services to institutions, including Bitcoin-backed lending, asset management, principal investments, Bitcoin services for financial advisors, and Bitcoin mining operations. For those new to Bitcoin, I recommend checking out Swan's Welcome to Bitcoin course at swan.com slash welcome. So go to swan.com slash breedlove today to get started on your Bitcoin buying journey. Are you sick of being robbed by politicians through inflation and endless money printing? If so, you need to be at Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee on July 25th through 27th. As the largest Bitcoin and fintech conference in the world, Bitcoin 2024 stands as a beacon of monetary freedom, a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Top speakers, companies, and thought leaders from across the industry will convene in Nashville to look ahead to the next year and beyond. I will be there, and Bitcoin conferences like this have become my favorite place to socialize since becoming a Bitcoiner. Ticket prices will increase soon. Get your tickets now and secure your spot at this game-changing event. So go to b.tc slash conference and use discount code BREEDLOVE to sign up for the Bitcoin 2024 conference. Again, that's b.tc slash conference, discount code BREEDLOVE. We're talking about obviously the nature of evil, the mythological personification of evil as Satan. Um, and I, this is also the adversary, as he talked about earlier, right? The mythological adversary versus the mythological hero. So these are the two poles of human character or human action. Um, and now he goes into the Christian doctrine of original sin and what that means. And so I'll read this excerpt here on page 319. Peterson writes, From the perspective informed by the belief in original sin, individual actions and motivations must always be carefully scrutinized and considered, even when apparently benevolent, lest the ever-present adversarial tendencies, quote-unquote, accidentally gain the upper hand. The dogma of original sin forces every individual to regard himself as the potential immediate source of evil and to locate the terrible underworld of mythology in its denizens in intra-psychic space. It is no wonder that this idea has become unpopular. Nonetheless, evil exists somewhere. 
it remains difficult not to see hypocrisy in the souls of those who would wish to localize it somewhere else. So again, this unavoidable idea or unavoidable reality that humans contain the potential for both good and evil. You can't really eradicate evil. Um, and it is something that exists, as he says, in intra-psychic space. So inside of our psychological space, this tendency uh, is ever-present. And so if I'm trying, you know, obviously, I guess looking at this through other lenses that we've been exploring these ideas earlier, it's as if original sin is the recognition of human moral fallibility, right? That we're always vulnerable to do evil um, or e even just to do wrong. We don't have to use a word so strong as evil, right? It, again, if uh, the word sin comes from that archery term, hamartia, right? And to miss the mark. So not just doing evil per se, that's some kind of like the purposeful inflicting of pain or harm on another, even just making a mistake, right? Just missing the mark morally or or even um, from a goal-directed standpoint, right? You try to do one thing and you create unintended consequences and you fail to achieve your goal. Like these are just ever-present realities of being human. So since we always are prone to missing the mark, we always need reconciliation or redemption, right? We need to be able to uh, have a solution for our errors or a or rectification for our errors, something like that. And so uh, this idea of original sin, right? Like the human, and I, I'm actually not completely versed on the actual doctrine of original sin. I couldn't recite it, but basically that humans are sinful creatures, right? We're, we're aiming creatures, but with the aiming, uh, in a world that is unknowable, right? The horizon of the future that is unknowable, we often miss the mark, which is to say that we often sin. And so we need this um, possibility of forgiveness or reconciliation, et cetera. So it's, it's another interpretation of a, of a religious doctrine in a more practical sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the original sin concept is hugely misunderstood uh, and it's also misunderstood i think by modern christian interpretations of it especially in the way it's presented to young christians it, it, in the the idea that everyone is sinful and that there's naturally something quote unquote wrong with you just for being human is is an idea that is naturally a bit difficult to wrap your head around and 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 it can even it can even be it can even make christianity or religion generally uh, something some somehow distasteful like it's it's just not uh not um it's not nice to to think about that concept but the problem is it's it's a it's a heavy concept and a necessary one and and coming to terms with these ideas i think is necessary for understanding the the purpose of what this is all getting at which as you say is about missing the mark and understanding that everyone has that capability built in original sin is even just saying that there is this capability in humans we all have this and nobody is perfect therefore it has to be dealt with and it there always has to be vigilance for it and i mean i think where this gets over complicated is is when layer upon layer of of implication comes from this original sin again the the idea of of humans controlling a concept that is otherwise good and useful uh, right like um morally punishing children and 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 saying that they're they're doing bad things and they're going to burn in hell and, and and things like that that that's sort of a 
uh, stereotypical example uh, uh, that uh, religious iconoclasts might use as a as a a reason why Christianity is overbearing and and no longer fit for purpose for younger generations. But it's it's missing the point, and people who do to uh, communicate the idea that way are are missing the point, I think. And so, as you say, the, this the original sin idea actually is what you what you were saying earlier that you can't get rid of so called evil. You can't get rid of the potential for evil. Mm-hmm. I think that's the I think mm-hmm. that's the uh, um, m- more accurate way of saying that you can't get rid of the potential. Everyone has the potential within us, but knowing that and the knowledge of good and evil, knowing that is the only way to have a hope at yeah. counteracting that. Yeah, I like how you worked in the phrase, the knowledge of good and evil there, because that's straight out of Genesis, right? That eating from the tree of knowledge gave Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil. Um, And so this really is the the fall of man in a way, right? That we do... We're distinct from animals in this way, that we understand ourselves more deeply, um, at least our capacities, right? We understand that, um, you know, we have to work today to provide for tomorrow. And even if we provide for tomorrow, well, there's always tomorrow. So we always are working, we're always planning and preparing for the future. But in all of that, rational reflective capacity is almost like evil comes along with that right because again it's well it's knowledge but if we mistake the map for the territory and we think the knowledge is complete well that's evil if we use that self-reflection to purposefully do harm to others that's evil if we use it you know it's a tool for adaptation basically that's why humans outcompete all other animals because we have this rational faculty but if we use that rational faculty to undermine our own adaptation, that's also evil, right? So it's, it's again, owner's manual for human rationality, maybe, to be more specific than just being human. Um, and so these, yeah, these stories are just very important in explaining that. Um, the next paragraph, he says... He goes into, I'll read the excerpt first. So he's talking about, I guess, religion being kind of a competitive marketplace, really, that different ideologies are put into practice. If we considered religion to be like a, you know, a practical application of a group ideology, something like, like here's a code of conduct and everyone accords themselves to it, well, different religions compete with one another over time as different groups succeed or fail um, you know, according to who adopted what religion. So Peterson writes that the monotheism of Judaism and Christianity has its roots in older, more polyistic thinking. The many gods of archaic conceptualization became the single ruler of more modern religious thinking as a consequence of spiritual competition, so to speak. This competition is the battle of ideas with implication for action. Fought in abstraction, image, and in the course of genuine earthly combat, portrayed in mythology as spiritual war, played out in heaven, which is the place where transpersonal ideas exist. The deity who came to prevail over all is one God with a complex set of attributes quote-unquote, surrounded by a panoply of angels and divine echoes of previous gods who represent those transpersonal and eternal psychological processes rendered subordinate in the course of the spiritual phylogenesis of man. So, you know, this is a very (laughs) major idea, like why one god? Um, I guess it's first useful to understand that the gods are representational of these transpersonal forces as he describes them, right? So rage, jealousy, lust, you know, different emotional motivations that are 
that we all experience some form of from time to time, but they're transpersonal because everyone has them, right? It's not, they're not unique to individuals. Everyone gets angry sometimes. Everyone probably has felt jealousy one in some way. Uh, you know, everyone's been in love. Well, most adults probably have been in love at least once, you know, et cetera. So the gods, again, in the pre-scientific paradigm, the gods were the literary mythological representations of these transpersonal forces. And the culmination into one god, this is a very complicated one. I think because the Christian god comes from the, the Neoplatonic notion of the good or the one. And there's this idea, like it's a metaphysical idea that all being is one, right? It's singular. And so I don't really know. I mean, I guess there's, this is, I don't even know if I'm qualified to talk about this necessarily, but in this battleground for different ideas or codes of conduct that religion represents, there seems to be this tendency away from polytheism towards monotheism. So towards one God and that monotheistic paradigm seems to reflect the metaphysics on which our understanding of the world is based, which is that being is somehow one, right? Everything is interconnected to be a thing is to be one thing. Um, and again, this goes way down the Neoplatonic rabbit hole, but that whole idea, all science is built on a metaphysics. And so the, the idea that a metaphysics in which being is oneness somehow correlates to there being a monotheistic perspective on God. And I don't exactly, I don't know, that's the best way I know how to say it. I don't fully understand it myself, but... Um, it's as if the, again, what if we're interpreting religion as kind of a tool, right? It, the one that best reflects reality wins. So we see monotheistic religions out competing polytheistic religions because our metaphysical understanding of the world is based on this inherent unity or oneness. And so that, yeah, it just, it's more truthful, I guess, in that way. So anyways, that's a complicated idea, but that's the oh, best yeah, I can do with that one. Super complicated, and and I mean, uh, I I can add something to this, but this is this is definitely one of those ideas that I've I've always I've struggled with for for a while. the The entire process of of going from polytheism to monotheism is one that's really historically muddled, right? Mm -hmm. Because the the thing about this is that the the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, was one of a polytheistic pantheon originally. Yes. It's it's just that he he said there shall be no other gods than me. Baal, Baal, was was the king god in Canaan for a long time. And then Yahweh, the followers of Yahweh come along and and there there's um there's some evidence to suggest that the real switch over to pure monotheism happened when the, the Jews uh were exiled to Babylon, which was a uh well of monotheism because of Zoroastrianism, which mm. which was in Babylon at that time, and so that's that's supposedly there is evidence that that's uh, uh, something that might have occurred, or at least it might have mm. strengthened the the monotheism there. Mm. Then, okay, fast forward a little while, and Christianity has has uh, picked up some steam, right? Well, so the the Catholic saints are are really the um corollary now to to polytheism so so there's there's definitely an argument that roman catholicism has has uh, stated that it is not polytheistic but by keeping saints and veneration of um mm. say the virgin mary and all this that it stays polytheistic in principle mm. in the sense that uh the the concept of saints was and likely at least partially a way of including uh, polytheistic gods in in worship as a way of getting uh, especially peoples in Europe to to convert to mm -hmm. Christianity, right? So so these were mechanisms at play, and 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 so to the extent that modern Christianity is actually fully 
monotheistic is debatable. Islam mm. would certainly be more directly uh, mm. monotheistic than than Christianity in in that sense. Christianity with the Trinity as well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm. Although certainly, certainly, having read this book, you can you can understand what the differences are between those things and the the yeah. different aspects that those that they represent. But it's interesting though that I've I've had difficulty with the idea that that money monotheism is so, sort of the inevitable inevitable end goal and i'm i think i still haven't fully wrapped my head around the idea exactly as you say it's 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 really really deep i i guess in the marketplace of ideas though the that the top god in the hierarchy being the one who pays attention as we've mm -hmm. seen yeah. And is the hero uh, of heroic adaptation that being the 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 one that is at the top of the hierarchy, consuming all other personalities into the oneness of that, the yeah. spirit and the essence of the hero, yeah, is the monotheistic god. As far as I can wrap my head around it, yeah, the inevitability of that I've I've not really been sure of because there I I can see that that there could be. Uh, well, no, that there is value in understanding these stories from a more polytheistic sort of perspective, mm -hmm. understanding the different psychological actors mm -hmm. at, at play. But at the end of the day, if the if the hero who who leads the adaptation and and fights against the adversary and and all this, if that is the ultimate end goal, then yeah, yeah I, I can see where that goes. So, oh, that's a lot of good points there, and. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, trying to unravel the mysteries of God. Uh, talk about like the main thing humans have been trying to do forever. Uh, I don't think I think it's almost in a way a word we use to represent that which is beyond words or understanding. I mean, we've talked a lot about the limitations of knowledge on this show and, and prior episodes while we need some epistemic representation for that which is beyond the reach of epistemology right what a, a, a placeholder for that which is beyond the reach of knowledge itself and i think god is that in some ways and so that's why it's so hard you can't actually define it but so and but we have to try right to talk about these things so it's almost like I, I like to analogize it to the number zero, right? The number zero is the number that represents no numbers, basically. And it's like the word God represents the truth that is beyond words, which if it were to, I'm talking about us through a Petersonian lens might be the totality of the known, the unknown, and the process that mediates between the two, right? Order, chaos, and action i guess that the dao that mediates between them you know yin yang dao whatever so that totality you might describe as god again if i'm drawing on the neoplatonic tradition it's this principle of unity just that all is one like everything is actually interconnected there is no separation in you know the universe which even if you look at that through a strict astrophysical interpretation of the big bang well, that's true, right? All is one. Everything came from one big bang and here's everything. So those are a couple of examples of me flailing about trying to put some meaning to that word. But I really think it's, again, you know, almost like it's a bulwark against totalitarianism because as long as that word God is not definable, then it's sort of representing to us and reminding us that we can't capture everything in words or knowledge and logic. And there's always the unknown. There's always, you know, another interpretation of God as the author of all things. Well, there's that unknown, unknowable unknown is always a participant in the authoring of reality. And so maybe, you know, God is meant to give us a, a very serious dose of humility in playing with these, the, tools we call you know rationality that it's very useful again excellent servant terrible master and god is a, a good reminder that the mind is that um 
I'll pause there. I, and it sort of segues nicely into the next topic, which I was going to read this expert on 321, but um, I'll pause there for you. Well, I've, I've got a couple of uh, points here and, and uh, I'm going to jump ahead uh slightly just to because you linked into uh the the yin yang here and i think this is this is a great point that uh, dr peterson also pulls in on this particular topic uh that the the yin and yang the constituent elements of existence is a is a topic that that's brought up the these diagrams that that show the known and the unknown and all this but he brings in the Tao into this, uh, in the yin and yang. On your PDF, it's probably something like page 343 or something like mm -hmm. that. It's, it's not that much further down here. Uh, but specifically, yang being the element of order and masculinity and the known, mm -hmm. that's the side that he associates with the, the term fascism and authoritarianism as described. Mm -hmm. And the yin being chaos, femininity, and the unknown, is the side that's associated with decadence and and nihilism, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, there's an excerpt here, if, if you don't mind me uh, just going ahead with this one, is that so uh, the, the theory of the genesis of so -called social psychopathology, this theory of a direct relationship between personal choice and fascistic or decadent personality and social movement, finds its precise echo in Taoist philosophy and can be more thoroughly comprehended through application of that perspective. The traditional Taoist believes that profane human experience consists of the differentiated parts of an essentially uncategorizable background, mm -hmm. the Tao, which may also be interpreted as meaning or as the way. And Tao manifests itself as the eternal flux of being. Uh, it, it continues for a while here, but the, the, what got me in there was the... It, it, the uncategorizable background right mm -hmm. the, yeah. the the word beyond words or, yeah, or exactly. what, whatever whatever it is right and so yeah. it, it it pulls it all it pulls it all in here right yeah. that that these aspects of humanity exist against that backdrop yes. and so d doesn't matter really the exact understanding of that whether it's the monotheistic god mm -hmm. whether it's the Tao, all of these things actually map and so he, he kind of loops back around at the end of this uh, big long section here and we can return to where we were, but mm. yeah, it sort of, it sort of covers that, that these modes of being uh, and, and I guess the, um, the attempt to push back on the, the, um, the good and the, the, what what we know is good the, these are also encapsulated mm -hmm. under under those categories so um, yeah. that was the the thing that came to mind there no thank you actually because that's important for me actually because i prior to bitcoin prior to all of this teenage years my first forays into philosophy was eastern philosophy so a lot of it was taoism and I forget sometimes how deeply influenced I am by Taoism. Um, so that definitely comes through in my interpretation of every everything, all my thinking, all everything. And there's one, I think this is in the Tao to Ching, right? The Tao, which we call the Tao, is not the Tao. It also says the finger that points at the moon is not the moon, right? So... Again, we're using words and language to try and point at reality, but words are just pointers to things, right? To concepts, frankly, but they are not the thing or the concept. So, you know, a, 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 the more secular way of saying this is that the map is not the territory, right? So words are a mapping tool, but they can never fully correspond to the territory. So I don't... You know, a single word I don't think can contain truth. Now, that doesn't mean there's not such thing as truthful and untruthful speech. It's more of like what is more tightly coupled to truth, like a more accurate representation. And, you know, there, well, there's the old saying, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. Why do we say that? 
I think we say that because the photo is a higher resolution depiction of reality, right? When you see a photo of a natural landscape, how could you ever turn that photo, that imagistic portrayal of a natural landscape, how could you turn that into something that was purely linguistic? I mean, I guess poetry is probably as close as you could get. So, you know, words have a purpose. They have a, the purposes for us to interconnect our minds. But again, the big theme we keep coming back to is like, they can't contain it all. If you ever think the words or the idea has contained it all, then you're in the domain of totalitarianism, right? You think, oh, my knowledge is total. I need to stop all further inquiry, all further exploration. And that's that should be a red flag. Anytime you think you've got the final answer. And it's a good reminder for us too as Bitcoiners because we're all like, oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes this. It's like, well, we should always be humble enough to to check how we arrived at that conclusion. Um, one other example, this is, came to me recently. People struggle with this one. And this is something that seems obvious to me. And I guess it seems obvious to me because of my Taoist influences. Like reading Taoism early in life, now I'm like, oh, of course truth is beyond words like just look around you how could you turn any of your experiences into a purely linguistic stream uh that there's a futurist that said language is a very thin pipe to describe something as complex as conscious experience and that lands for me very seriously and it, you know i think if you just look at anything and imagine how you would turn that into a pure linguistic stream you'll quickly see how limited words are but to try and drive this point home, you know, people do struggle with this idea and they think that language can contain truth or contain reality in its totality. Okay. If you think that, if you really believed that, then a word like ineffable would have no meaning. Like ineffable means, you know, unexplainable by words, basically, right? Beyond words, beyond yeah, it cannot be explained by words. Well, if everything could be contained in words, then that word would not exist. It would not have any meaning. You know, like it, it has meaning for a reason. It has meaning because truth and capital T, ultimate reality truth is beyond words. The map is not the territory. So anyways, I don't mean to belabor the point, but it's something that seems incredibly obvious to me and is not obvious to a lot of people for that exact reason, I think actually is the Taoist influence that you so deftly pointed to. Oh, fascinating. And, and I mean, it, it comes right back to these points that we've been discussing as well. Right. It, it, I, what I love is when these ideas have so many parallels, right. That there can be a Petersonian way of looking at things mm -hmm. that maps right on to uh well i mean he's he he pulls it a, a western way of looking at things that maps onto an eastern way of looking at things that jordan peterson articulates that mises articulates mm -hmm. that that some uh uh other thinker artic articulates in a different way and it's it's just when it, when all of this stuff points to something that's saying the same thing from different perspectives Yes. Well, what's the truth there? And that maybe that's the meta lesson here, right? Is that is that when there are so many parallels, right? That the concept of God having so much concept to the to the concept of the Tao, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what's the lesson there? That that there is something to this, and this is something worth exploring, and and uh, being hung up on on original influences of of say uh, an overly religious upbringing that doesn't effectively communicate what the religion actually means the values of that right yeah maybe getting over that hang up in adulthood would be a good idea to yeah. better understand those things yeah yeah and i think a lot like, of us have that right i mean i had that myself and that's why i'm such a advocate of peterson's work because he helped me overcome that and actually, by the very method you just described, right? When this is called consilience, when you see a thing at one level of analysis indicates a thing is true, it's like, okay, you have a certain degree of certainty. But if you approach it through a completely different framework and it also indicates that the same thing is true, well, then you kind of have two proof points and you have a higher probability that it's true. 
And the more levels of analysis you can approach a thing and have it point to the same conclusion, well, then the higher confidence interval you can have in your conclusion. Uh, to try, try to say that simply, like if you can smell a thing, it's you know one level of true. If you can smell it and see it, it's another level of true. If you can smell it, see it, touch it, it's another level of true. If you smell it, see it, touch it, taste it, feel it, well, then it's pretty damn true, right? So, um, and Peterson's work for me does that, right? He takes these mythological stories, which I originally thought in my ignorance were just adult fairy tales, useless adult fairy tales, vestiges of our tribal history, you know, whatever, like dispense with them. And he starts to interpret them through multiple lenses, multiple thinkers, you know, biology, psychology, game theory, et cetera. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, there is a lot <laughs> packed into very few words in these stories. So it's, uh, I mean, it's almost poetic in that way, right? It's, um, I, 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 I forgot who said this, but the artist uses lies to point to deeper truths and it's almost like mythology is a the you know pinnacle of that in terms of describing the deeper truths of being human right we're and i'm not i don't, don't want even coming after me saying that you know this religion is true or that religion is not true i'm not talking about the historicity like did it actually happen I'm not even going to debate that, frankly. It's like, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. I'm not here to conclude one way or another. But the mythological construction of the story itself points to a deeper truth, irrespective of whether or not there's any historical accuracy. So it's like, you could you could prove that Jesus of Nazareth never lived and I don't think it would change anything. I really don't. Like he's already embedded in our culture. It's embedded. I'm sure. I mean, it does change some things, but the the nature, the moral intuitions we have developed over time. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning now on the book "Inventing the Individual" that talks about the impact Christ has had over time. Um. Anyways, so to take this back to the book, um. I mean, suffice it to say, knowledge is a necessary aspect of being a rational animal, but it's not sufficient in a strange sort of paradoxical way, because if you think the knowledge is the whole thing, then you're not, um, you're no longer in the domain of truth in a way. So there's other ways of knowing that are not propositional as John Verveke might say, right? There's procedural levels of knowing, et cetera. So I'll read an excerpt here, and that may all sound kind of abstract and pointless, but again, there's very practical consequences to that. Peterson writes on my page 321 that what quote-unquote knowing everything means, however, at least in practice, is that the unknown no longer exists and that further exploration has therefore been rendered superfluous, even treacherous. This means that absolute identification with the quote-unquote known necessarily comes to replace all opportunity for identification with the process that comes to know. The presumption of absolute knowledge, which is what I've been calling totalized knowledge, which is the cardinal sin of the rational spirit, is therefore prima facie equivalent to rejection of the hero to rejection of christ of the word of god of the divine process that mediates between order and chaos the arrogance of the totalitarian stance is ineradicably opposed to the quote-unquote humility of creative exploration humility it is only constant admission of error and capacity for error admission of sinful and ignorant nature that allows for recognition of the unknown and then for update of knowledge and adaptation in behavior. Such humility is, somewhat paradoxically, courageous, as admission of error and possibility for error constitutes the necessary precondition for confrontation with the unknown. This makes genuine 
cowardice, the underground motivation for the totalitarian presumption. The true authoritarian wants everything unpredictable to vanish. The authoritarian protects himself from knowledge of this cowardice by a show of patriotic advocacy, often at apparent cost to himself. So again, you know, totalized knowledge is evil because it implies that the process of gaining new knowledge has now been rendered pointless because what is currently known is all there is to know. And so, I mean, I think we've, we've hit the point a lot, but Peterson sort of uh, unpacks it very eloquently there. Yeah, and I mean, where can we point to this totality of understanding in our modern day? I don't think it's worth going into the examples in too much depth here, but there's a lot of people, groups that claim to have the totality of knowledge and want to impose it yes. upon others. And the thing about this is that they might not understand that what they're actually doing is preventing the adaptation into the future. They're, they're stifling it is the patriarchy in the negative sense, even if a lot of the people who claim to be doing this claim to be, who are doing this claim to be against the patriarchy. They're, they're uh, embodying its negative spirit in, mm. in full force. Uh, and and the, the thing there is that this gets into specifics. The One of the great parts about this chapter is that there are so many ways of describing real behaviors and that maybe you can see some patterns in your own life. Thinking that you know everything about anything, any subject. Someone can be an expert, but still have plenty to learn. And, and you know, the, the, the true masters are the, are the ones who, who keep learning mm -hmm. constantly, learning constantly and updating and, 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 and growing. And, and if someone says that, that this is just the way it is. The science is settled. Mm. You know, it's it's uh, evil is the right word. And I mean, another another point you said earlier about sort of that maybe evil isn't always the right word, and that saying something something is wrong. Mm. That, that that's right to a point uh, to a specific point where where that that intentionality is important. Of course, mm -hmm. intentionality mm -hmm. is important when someone misses the mark, right? But some things like these, I don't think have that degree mm -hmm. calling something evil isn't necessarily saying that that the whole person is evil but their behavior is evil and what they're sure. doing is evil and and calling out evil is also inherently good calling mm -hmm. out evil when you see it is is a way to counteract yes. evil in the world yes and so, and so, maybe that maybe this is where the conspiracy theorists or uh, the the contrarians have their place in the world, no matter whether they're insane or mm. maybe they're actually right. You know, mm -hmm. the, that no no matter what, knowledge needs to be challenged. To mm. totalitarianism of knowledge needs to be challenged. Needs to be challengeable. Yes. Otherwise, it it doesn't work. And and modern science is completely broken. I I, I mean. The concept of peer review uh, naturally leads to that only those articles or w whatever that that agree with current scientific consensus really get pushed forward, and uh, new ideas have a much higher threshold of needing overwhelming new evidence to to even get considered by the the so called peer review system. So science is essentially being static for. A long time, new, new things that aren't controversial can come through, but but mm -hmm. not that challenge the the existing frameworks and and so yeah, maybe a more decentralized model uh, would be worth considering. Mm. Yeah, well said. Um, yeah, it's we we have as he says in this passage. Actually, we have both a sinful and an ignorant nature. So sinful to your point on intentionality would seem to be, I don't know. It's not just intent. It's sin seems to be more in the moral sphere, right? When you, you transgress against the moral code seems to be kind of like a, a, a sinful missing of the mark, but then there's just all just normal mistakes, right? Like, Oh, I tried to, 
whatever plant the farm and the crops died right you just made a mistake or maybe you didn't even make a mistake right maybe nature just went against you there was a drought there was a flood whatever the thing is and you were ignorant of that future contingency playing out and it got you right it 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 thwarted your aim that's part of deal like it's part of the thing right it's like it's going to happen anyone that tries to do anything is going to fail at some point so it's it's this radical acceptance of both our sinful and our ignorant nature that as you said can counteract it to some extent or at least help us recover from the falls um and then also to your point on calling out evil as a counter action to evil that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes uh if you see a fraud and do not say fraud then you are a fraud All right and that's very inspiring for seeing fiat currency frankly like as bitcoiners i think we have to speak out and say if you understand how this game is being played there's some moral duty there because there's the truth that's being used to victimize a lot of people and if you don't assist those people to adapt to that truth then to some extent you're complicit in that fraud you know what i mean so it's like you kind of have to and i'm not i'm not advocating for people to put themselves at risk or whatever but it's like to the extent that you can or are comfortable maybe comfortable is a dangerous word because you need to push your comfort zone a little bit at times as well but you should be calling it out rather than just being complicit in it or silent about it um that's what contributes to this process of of adaptation or civilization as we've been talking about um yeah and and i mean not to take this in into too much of the current weeds or anything but i think that also extends to calling out bad actors in the space uh um giacomo zuko recently had a, a tweet that uh that i really liked that uh uh bitcoin is for enemies it's for your enemies mm -hmm. it's not for enemies of bitcoin right and what what i get from that is sort of the extension of all of this is that is that if there are people actually trying to do harm to to the system that is is actively an antidote to fiat currency and and mm -hmm. all that with the money system that that that's the that's the other thing and um, just for for me personally, that's been something that's been been guiding me lately in in terms of just navigating that there are complexities and and there are a lot of different ways to to uh, interpret what Bitcoin is 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 for and and I keep personally going back to that it's 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 this tool to to solve the money system and mm. um, yeah call, calling out I, I like that you see a fraud and don't say fraud you are a fraud it's yeah. It's again one of those hard lessons, right? It's hard. Harsh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. it's harsh. And it's funny how these cultural battles unfolding in Bitcoin are kind of microcosms of deeper issues we've dealt with many times again, many times throughout history. That particular one is interesting. And I agree. Like, call it out, right? Use speech. Use speech. That's That should be our first line of defense against everything, basically. It's how we share perspectives and adapt right without force basically um it does get a bit more murky for me though and i don't i'm not saying that i've seen this advocated for but it seemed the tone that i've seen has at times seemed to me that bitcoiners are advocating for legal compulsion to stop certain things on bitcoin what you know uh whatever ordinals you know, shit coins on Bitcoin, whatever the thing is that I don't, I don't think I can advocate. I don't think I can get behind that. It's like, call it out by all means. Um, if people are actively being defrauded and robbed, it's like, okay, well then maybe legal compulsion is necessary, but if they're just being, it's a weird, it's a weird line, right? Because you would say, okay, um, these people are being lied to and having their money stolen. Well, there's a weird line because 
innovation, right? Like the people that started Instagram, for instance, when they're raising money for this idea, it's a vision of a company, what it's going to be one day. It's like, well, when they're raising the money for it and they're cre they're selling a vision, it doesn't actually exist yet. So they're selling something that doesn't really exist. So I, I guess it comes down to the intentionality again, which is very hard to be black or white on, right? Like how, and this is obviously a core component of the law, right? Determining, well, was it murder or was it manslaughter? Like was the intention nefarious or not? And it's very difficult, I think, to to drill down to that at times. So anyways, and yeah. I, and, and, I, and I completely agree that legal compulsion is, is not something that should be uh, the way to solve things in Bitcoin. That's sort yeah. of the, takes away the point of Bitcoin. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's all I'll say on that point. Lots more to that uh, particular rabbit hole, but I, I don't think this is the uh, right uh, time to discuss it. Yes, agree, agreed. Um, so with the last 20 minutes here, should we mention some examples of the 20th century or where should we go with this? I've got actually th three excerpts to lead into that and kind of tie off this point. The, the section is the voluntary degradation of the map of meaning. And I, mm -hmm. I think there's there, there's... Uh, yeah, th three excerpts of this that will get to this point. And actually, the the uh, Dao um, part that I mentioned is is sort of a, the end of of that section. But yeah. uh, I I think I think this is the last nuance of this point that really underscores the futility of acting in a intentionally evil way. Mm. So this starts on. Um, my book's 325. That should be something like 330 for you. Got it. Individual existence means limited existence, limited in space and time. The existence of the limits makes experience possible. The fact of them makes experience unbearable. We have been granted the capacity for constant transcendence as an antidote, but frequently reject that capacity because using it means voluntarily exposing ourselves to the unknown. We run away because we're afraid of the unknown at bottom. Such fear also makes us cling to our protective social identities, which shield us from what we do not understand. So while running away, we necessarily become slave to convention and habit and deny the troublesome best within ourselves. Why, one, why run away? It's fear. Fear of the unknown and its twin, fear of rejection by the protective social world, which leads to pathological subjugation of unique individual personality to rejection of the totality of personal being, which, when manifested, has truly redemptive capability. The Great Father hates innovation and will kill to prevent it. The Great Mother, source of all new knowledge, has a face that paralyzes when encountered. How can we not run away when confronted by such powers? But running away means that everything worthwhile ages then dies. Pretty heavy, that one. Yeah, I'll say so. So what I take uh, from, from this is that one of the goals of humanity because the, this this section by the way i think is really starting to uh sprint down the hill towards really the thesis of this book mm -hmm. this is where it's starting the transcendence of the limited existence right that's that's there's something to that transcending mm -hmm. the the limits of experience that sort of yeah. put a uh uh a limit a bounds on on what is the the known and running away from that intentionally is the nuance here, right? Mm -hmm. And and what I like is that it it in this section it uh, it puts up two two sides of reasons to run away, right? Hating innovation because innovation is uh, a threat to the existing order, and then at the same time, the source of all new knowledge will probably kill you if you don't interact with it in the right mm, way, right? Yeah. So it's it's such a difficult line, but you can't. You can't run away from it because if you run away, you'll age and then die. Mm. You, you, you won't transcend. Mm. And 
it's it's scary and and throws in the face of of uh the it throws in the individual's face a challenge are you going to transcend your existence or are you going to run away right so where where i where i take this uh is that this is the reason why evil starts and and there's 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 a a, a lot more here uh but uh do, what what are your what are your thoughts on on this part before the next excerpt here uh i would just echo back yeah the the ambivalence of the unknown right that it's both kind of the source of all of our problems but it's also where we discover solutions like the you know the horizon of the future is both threatening but it's also what we can plan towards and work towards a better version of so there's this in the unknown is where all the potential is but it's also where all the threat is so there's it's like and that's why he talks so much about the right orientation towards it you know if you approach it courageously with the right attitude with a good understanding of how you work and how reality works well then you're most fit to deal with it and if you don't well then you are more prone to sin and or ignorance um and your you know your point on transcendence i think again just echoes back the importance of the mythology right that is how we transcend in a way right the seeing ourselves from a higher level like literally transcend as in a transcend into a higher level of understanding of ourselves to accord ourselves better in the world yeah and and i mean the these examples um i've i've got two two more here but i i think these things are showing what um what the individual can do and how the individual can do it to to just ignore the reality in front of them mm -hmm. basically and what it's really saying is what's the opposite of paying attention ignoring the world yes ignorance right? yeah ignorance it, yeah. Uh, willful ignorance yeah. right um may, maybe maybe just the 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 last one here as a as a as a point that sort of um there's a whole bunch about the kind of the concept of the the lie the individual who's lying to himself right mm -hmm. uh and and so the next excerpt i've got is page 329 i think 334 for you the individual who lives by the lie continually shrinks his domain of competence his explored and familiar territory Eventually, in consequence, he has nowhere left to turn except to himself. Mm. But his own personality has, in the meantime, become shrunken and inept as a consequence of underdevelopment, as a consequence of repeated failure to participate in the process that turns pre-cosmogonic matter into spirit and world. Mm. Nothing remains but weakness, resentment, hatred, and fear. Thus, the chaos that is rejected out of desire for too much security attains its inevitable victory. The vicious circle created by the liar spirals down inevitably to the underworld. That's so that's one. that's hell. That's yeah. that's the that's the individual creating hell for themselves by lying to themselves and shrinking their own reality. So yes, it's another side of evil. It's voluntarily lying to yourself to ignore the map yes that is shared by society that will give you nourishment and all that is good willfully denying that is evil to oneself yes i think that's the point there which is once again consistent with this idea of impeding adaptation because when you tell a lie, you create a little fork of reality, right? You're telling, you're representing that something happened that did not happen. And that eventually that fork must be reconciled back to the main chain, to use the Bitcoin analogy. And 
you know, the, what is the Buddhist saying that three things cannot remain long hidden, the sun, the moon, the truth, like the day of reckoning is inevitable. The truth's going to come out eventually. You have now wasted your energy in telling this lie. You now need to waste further energy upholding that lie over time. All for not basically, eventually it's going to crumble, right? You've created this little mini house of cards. And so that it's not just moral in a way, right? It's almost informational. It's like you can't, like, this is why it's important to tell the truth is because you're facilitating your own process of adaptation. You're facilitating the adaptation of others by accurately representing to them what you take to be true. And the other point Peterson makes, I don't know if he does it in this so much, but from his lectures, he's saying, like, you know, the more you lie, the more you corrupt your own orienting mechanisms basically that you can't trust yourself basically like the more you lie to others or to yourself the less you can actually trust yourself and when push comes to shove and you really need your faculties to deal with some unfolding situation well if you can't trust yourself or your instincts or your intuitions well then you've got a big problem so it's not just like oh tell the truth because it's the morally just thing to do it's also very practically like uh, in your own interest, in the interest of your own self-preservation, preserving your faculties for when they matter most, you should really tell the truth. And that is, I mean, I think that is probably common to all wisdom traditions, right? Like, do not lie, do not steal, do not kill. Um, I think there's very deep reasons why. Yeah, and and I, I think the rejection of the wisdom traditions is is part of the the nihilism essentially and yeah. and you know intentional rejection of this stuff intentional is important because kids kids are likely to rebel from the power structure and and i mean we've seen why that's sort of a part of the the upbringing. You, you, yeah. If you rebel and come back, you're 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 good. Uh, but if you rebel and completely reject society, I mean, some people don't come back from that. I I know people personally who who live in the loop. Um, yes, I, I described there, and and it's it's terrible. Um, and some people never recover. And uh, mm -hmm. le leaving an example to how to avoid that, I think is is a really strong um, reason to talk about this stuff and try to explain it. So yes. if, if, if you wanted to get into some of the 20th century stuff, we could, but uh, I think, uh, I think honestly, what we could yeah. do is maybe give a good example or maybe read one passage from Solzhenitsyn because basically he goes into the work, as you said earlier, heavily of Solzhenitsyn. So if you really wanted Obviously, we've discussed a lot of this in kind of an abstract format today, but if you wanted to see the very practical realities of evil taken to the extreme, well, just study the horrors of the 20th century, which will get you into the work of Solzhenitsyn, um, et cetera. Yeah. I wanted to mention this, though, just on your last point. This is a tweet I saw today talking about rejecting wisdom traditions and the, the danger of it. Um, so we're recording this on March 30th, 2024, the white house, Joe Biden and the white house just announced they're going to have their first trans visibility day on March 31st, 2024, which is Easter Sunday. So I will just leave that piece of information out there without comment um, in the context of what we've been talking about. I love it. And um, well, yeah, I'll further not comment, but but leave that. And, <laughs> you know, to the, to the final point, the 20th century um, examples, the what what dr peterson really focuses on first there first there is an example of uh, essentially life in a concentration camp that's pretty bleak mm. solzhenitsyn gets into uh, a sort of different kind of concentration camp uh the the gulag system 
the Gulag Archipelago is a difficult uh, book or mm-hmm. collection of books, depending on if you have the abridged version or the 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 full thing. I would say you're a masochist if you want to read all three volumes, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, go at it, I guess. Um, these things are bleak, and they they bring real um, context to this. I don't have a, any specific. Uh, excerpt picked out from um, Solzhenitsyn in, in mm. particular, but I, I think the idea is is more like these are examples of the the deepest level of horror of of, of, subje- of subjecting an, uh, another person to, mm. and the the section is called it's that that the uh, this is a twentieth century allegory allegory sort of being like like the 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 story telling the lesson right and and mm. so it's so it's saying that the the stories of the 20th century, the, the, the actions of the 20th century, the history of the 20th century is, is a way of describing this. I, mm. I, I personally would, would, would rather let, let, uh, um, Solzhenitsyn and, and them speak for, uh, themselves. Uh, of course we could, we could tackle it, uh, another time, but if you have, if you have, um, an excerpt you'd like to look at from, from that, um, um, I will just give one that mentions a few, of these events for the audience that might want to go into them, but I'm with you. Like I've, I wrote a piece once on totalitarianism and it took me about two months to write it. And by the end of it, my soul was so darkened. Like there's just been very horrible things done by humans to other humans. And even just reading about it for relatively long period of time, fucking hurt. Like I did not enjoy it at all. So I'd rather not do a lot of that here. But for those of you who may have not really come to terms with how far evil can go, it can be useful, right? It can be useful to look into that darkness. And and indeed, that's a lot of what Peterson did in his early career, right? He read and studied these atrocities, trying to understand the nature of evil. Uh, I'll just read this one brief excerpt that just mentions a few of them that you could go into more if you if you were interested peterson writes the rwandan massacres the killing fields in cambodia the tens of millions dead by solzhenitsyn's estimate as a consequence of internal repression in the soviet union the untold legions butchered during china's cultural revolution the great leap forward Another black joke accompanied upon occasion in the particular by devouring of the victim. The planned humiliation and rape of hundreds of Muslim women in Yugoslavia. The Holocaust of the Nazis. The carnage perpetrated by the Japanese in mainland China. Such events are not attributable to human kinship with the animal, the innocent animal, or even by the desire to protect territory, interpersonal and intrapsychic but by a deep-rooted spiritual sickness endemic to mankind, the consequence of unbearable self-consciousness, apprehension of destiny and suffering and limitation, and pathological refusal to face the consequences thereof. So, um, yeah, there's a few events you could look into if you were interested to learn more, but... um, it's yeah the 20th century man um and i'll quote ron paul here or paraphrase ron paul it's no coincidence that the century of total war and the century of central banking were the same century these atrocities were funded by one institution common among all nation states and um well insert bitcoin right fix the money fix the world not not saying bitcoin fixes evil something we'll always contend with as we've said but we can at least stop dumping fuel on the fire i think by fixing the money if it reduces the capacity for humans to do evil intentionally bitcoin is one of the highest goods that I can conceive of. I yeah. haven't thought of another one. Yeah. Dr. Peterson says, focus 
your attention on the highest good you can conceive of. That's your yes. North Star. Bingo. For me, that's Bitcoin. So, Amen to that. And uh, I think that is a great place to draw it to a close. Sounds great. Thank you again and looking forward to the next one. Thanks, Rob. Till then. Thank you.